Again, welcome everyone to Criminal Law. That's Law 103S, as in spring. And if you look on your academic calendar, and Pastor, I did not receive an email from you, so, but I will send it to you when you send it to me, okay? If you look on our academic calendar, we almost have the first page almost done. We have Criminal Law Lecture today, and we also have Criminal Law Lecture on Wednesday, two hours each. But if you'll notice, look at the week after that contract, starting on Monday the 21st. We have a chat session. Our very first chat session will be on Monday from 5.30 to 6.30. Now, remember, if you can't make it to the chat session, we archive every single lecture. So if you can't make it, you can go and watch it. All right? Also on that first, that, that fourth week of contracts, if you'll notice on Wednesday, our lecture only goes instead of 7 to 9, it goes from 7 to 8, and then we do 8 to 9 for our essay, okay? No, no, Pastor Raymond, you were going to email me, remember? Uh, so I don't have to worry about getting the right one with me by email, and uh, then I can just turn around and reply, and I can add it on there for, for you. Okay? All right. So after criminal law this week, next week we start with our chats and our essays. What I will do is I will tomorrow, I'm going to make a note of it. As a matter of fact, I will make a note of it right now uh, for Tuesday to post the contracts, chat, and essay. And I'm also going to, if you notice, towards the following week is the chat one and essay one. So I'm going to post them both tomorrow so that you can get a head start on them. You can download them. You can look at them. You can try to figure out, hope to... Uh, what the answers are, and that way, uh, if you got some type of study group going on, that's good too, because then you guys could, in your study group, discuss them. Uh, you'll have almost a week to talk about them if I post them tomorrow, so that's good, okay? Hopefully, you can get the most out of it. All right. Well, let us start on our handout. Okay. All right. Let us criminal law week one. Let us begin. Classifications of crimes. We we need to classify our crimes simply because not so much as to know how many uh, certain classifications there are, uh, but you'll see as we get going that there is some uh, absolute distinctions between them when they come into play with other uh, crimes, okay? So the classifications are typically, if you go over to page 94 in the case book, 94 and 95, there are three types of classifications you are only going to be responsible for two of them, okay? There are times in my class when I will give you what maybe the California law is, uh, what some states do, uh, and there are, there are things that we will never talk about. And this is one of those cases where when we classify the crimes, we have our top crimes, which is a felony, okay? We have our next one, which is a misdemeanor. Now, those are the only two that we are going to ever discuss after today, okay? Felonies and misdemeanors. And if you look over on page 94, it talks about they, they divided the groups into three major groups, treason, felony, and misdemeanor, and the problem is treason was a felony, but I'll explain um, what that, how that comes into play, how it comes into a little different. 
Um, it says to remove the uncertainty which had developed in the ancient law, the statute of treasons enacted in 1350 specified exactly what should constitute this offense, including, amongst other wrongs, a manifest intent to kill the king, queen, or prince, levying war against the king, adhering to the enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Okay? It is the only crime that is mentioned in the Constitution. The only crime. Okay? Now, if we look, uh, let's go over to page 95, second paragraph. Uh, what has been said shows the common law classification to be unsound because one category was determined by the nature of the wrong perpetuated and the other two by the penalty provided. <coughs> In fact, since treason was punished by forfeiture of lands and goods and by death, it was strictly speaking a felony. That's true, see? Although it was convenient to deal with it as a separate category for procedural reasons, and I'll talk about what that procedure is, Statutes in this country commonly divide offenses into two classes. Number one, felony, and two, misdemeanors. The determinant is usually the penalty imposed, although the exact nature of the penalty employed for this purpose is not uniform. Okay? Now, if you go to that third paragraph, some jurisdictions have provided for a different classification than just felonies and misdemeanors, and have classified some minor offenses as infractions. Okay? Uh, now, the California, go next with California Penal Code divides crimes into felonies, misdemeanors, and infractions. So infractions are the last category. And I tell you that because this is obviously, it's a California law school. You're going to be taking the California bar exam. Someday you may be a California attorney. You may be living and practicing law in California. It's always good to know what goes on in your state. Instead of just going and saying, oh, can you tell me what these infractions are? Ah, we never had that in law school. It wasn't, the professor said it wasn't important, so I never learned it. No, you do need to learn it, okay? If you're living in California, you should know what it is. And I will talk a little bit about it, okay? All right, now, what does a felony, as we were reading in that second paragraph, uh, if we're talking about up to two classes, felony misdemeanor, it said um, had been resembled to the common law uh, in this except that a capital offense is a felony. All right. So what it really does is if you look down at the very end of that second paragraph on 95, it says it may be based upon either the type of institution in which the offender may be incarcerated, such as state prison, or the length of term which may be as imposed as, for example, a term exceeding one year. All right. So a felony is incarceration for more than one year, and you spend that time in prison, all right? Whereas a misdemeanor is up to one year, and your time is served in, in a jail, a county jail. That's where the misdemeanors come in, okay? Now, the infraction, let me tell you one thing about felonies and misdemeanors. Felonies and misdemeanors, you are uh, allowed to have, by the Constitution, you are, they have to give you right to an attorney and a jury trial. Right to an attorney and a jury trial. Now, States, I mean, I'm sorry, most states, at least east of the Mississippi, and that's kind of a dividing line. You get west of the Mississippi, you start getting into the western states. I mean, the, does anyone think that Texas is not a western state? Yet, you know what time zone it's in, don't you? It's in the central time. It's not Rocky Mountain, and it's not Pacific. Texas is in the central time, the same thing as Chicago is. All right? But we think of Texas as the worst, right? Of course. Oh, God, it's totally the South. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, but I'm just saying, you don't think of it as a central state. You think of it more of a Western state, whether it be Southwestern, okay? Now, most states east of the Mississippi don't really use infractions too much. They like the felony and misdemeanors. 
Matter of fact, if you're in Illinois, uh, or matter of fact, let me give you an example. I was up in Wisconsin once, and um, a lot of the states in the Midwest, for some reason, the police don't like other people from other states. I have no idea why. Uh, but if you're going through Illinois, you don't have Illinois license plates, you better watch your speed. When I moved back to Illinois, I was driving my van that had California plates. The police officer, state police officer, stopped me. Okay? No. And when I got stopped, I asked, what's the problem, officer? You were doing five over the limit. I'm thinking five over the limit. I have truck drivers because the limit on the for trucks is, is probably about five miles an hour or ten miles an hour less than cars. I have trucks passing me up. If I'm going five over limit, they're going 15 over the limit. Okay? Why? California license plates. Odyssey plates. All right? So then I explained to them I'm moving back to Chicago. I'm born and raised there, and I'm moving back to the Chicago area. Um, I actually live in Aurora, a suburb of uh, Chicago. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, I, uh, so once he realized that, he go, oh, I'll give you a warning. All right, like, what, for 5 old, you're going to warn people? Gee, you know, but they do that. They, they're, they're like that. You know, they, uh, they don't like uh, other things. So I'm up in Wisconsin, and um, I'm in in a small town and there is a four-way stop and there is a uh, a guy pulling a camper of some sort he's in the left lane and he's going to turn left and he's the vehicle in front of me so i pull up on the right there doesn't say that there's no lane i mean it's big enough for two lanes so i pull up he stops i stop we both go he turns left i go forward i get a ticket for passing at an intersection, okay? So I'm going to fight it. So I go back up there, and uh, what they do is lead not guilty. The, they, they take a little break, and then they have a judge of this day comes and talks to you and explains to you what your chances are of doing that, and they may charge you a court cost if you continue on and all this other stuff. And he's looking at my ticket and goes, so you – you pass on the right at a stop sign when the other vehicle is turning left. I said, yeah. He says, I don't see the problem. I do, I do this all the time. I said, yeah, I know. So then he says, just wait a minute here. So he goes out to talk to the police officer um, and his sergeant or whatever. And he comes back and he goes, nope, they want to pursue it. I said, you know what? That's a good idea. Because traffic tickets, tickets like this for a, for a stop sign are a misdemeanor. Okay, and I said, you know what? I, I I like that idea. He wants to do it. Then I want a jury, because they're gonna pay juries now. In the in the Midwest, they pay for juries. I remember years ago I was on a jury, and we're talking in the seventies, and I was on a jury, and they were giving like twenty five, thirty dollars a day, plus they gave you a reasonable amount for bus fare, and they gave you some money to buy lunch. That was all included. So that's a lot of money that the state has to pay that jury, juror. So I figured, okay, you know what? I want to, I said, I told him, please, uh, the, this judge, I told him, I said, I'm going to ask for a jury trial, which typically in California is at least 12 plus at least one alternate. And do you don't realize how much it is at $25 each? Well, that's $300 just for the 12 plus if they have to pay anything else. So he's realizing that even if they win it, they're going to lose money on this deal. So he says, wait a minute, I'll be right back. <laughs> so he goes in there, and he goes, I talked to the judge. He's going to dismiss the charges, all right? Now, that was the problem we had in California, was that people, stop signs, stop lights, 10 over the limit, all these little tiny petty offenses, we... You had a right to a jury trial. And if you didn't couldn't afford an attorney, we would appoint an attorney for you. Wow. All right, so what California did, and a lot some of the western states did, 
was that they created this infraction, a new classification of crimes. See, because we notice on felonies and misdemeanors, you can have incarceration up to a year, more than a year, time in jail. Well, the infractions, they said, you know what? There is absolutely no, there's going to be no possible jail time. Okay? And therefore, because there's no jail time, it's merely going to be a fine at the most, you do not have a right to a jury trial, and you do not have a right to a appointed attorney. Now remember, I don't care what it is, you always have a right to an attorney. If you want an attorney and you can pay for them, you, you're going to get, you, you can bring in your own attorney. You're never denied the right to counsel. But you're, the, the court's not, the state's not paying for an infraction. So when you go to court for an infraction, all you have is a judge. And unless you're being charged with a misdemeanor such as DUI. See, DUI, that is, uh, you can have a jury for that because that's a misdemeanor. Misdemeanor hit and run, you have a jury. Felony hit and run, you can have a jury. Okay? But most, the vast amount of the vehicle code in California are all infractions. And that was to avoid the jury trials and to attorneys. You come up and you're speeding 20 over the limit. You say, Your Honor, I want a jury trial. You have no right to it. Well, I don't have any money, so I want a, an attorney. Too bad. You don't get one. Okay? So the infractions really worked out well in California. Could you realize if everyone could have had a jury trial? You realize how many more jury notices that you would get? Okay, I used to get them all the time. And you, you know, police officers have a, a waiver; they can get out of jury trial, but attorneys can't. And I'll tell you, I've been on jury trials. I mean, I've been called for jury duty. Never been called to stay there once. I was called into the box. I'm thinking, all right, I'm, I'm going to get here. I'm going to be on here. I mean, as long as I'm here. Let's see the inner workings, you know? And so I get there, and um, it was always the, the prosecutor that threw, I mean, the uh, defense attorney that always threw me off. And so I figured, okay. I told him, I, he says, do you have any uh, legal background? And one of the questions, they, they put a post of a bunch of lists. And one of it, do you or uh, someone in your media family have any legal, a uh, formal legal training. So I raised my hand. I says, yes, your honor, I'm an attorney. And he says to me, well, uh, juror number eight, whatever my number was, says, juror number eight, do you think that you could put all that training out of your mind uh, for this court case? You know, because he wants you to only learn, use the rules and the facts that they give you. Nothing else, nothing brought in. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, yeah, I went to law school, passed the bar, and now you want me to forget everything. I almost was going to say, no, what do you think I am, Your Honor, a judge? You know, I, I didn't, of course. And so I says, no, Your Honor, I don't think so. He goes, I didn't think so either. You're dismissed. I, the bailiff, he says, I have never seen anybody get dismissed so fast. He says, you didn't get the seat warm. I says, yeah, I know. I, I says, and, and I wanted to get there. I mean, they just... I went over to the people there. I said, you know, I'd love to be on it. They won't let me on. Either the prosecution's throw me off or the defense is throwing me off. I can throw off only from the defense. But one time I even went on. I told them about how I had a business venture going on with a, an attorney. I mentioned his name, and he handles some uh, uh, cases for the ACLU, and he does uh, some um, uh, of the capital uh, offenses. And the prosecutor threw me off. So I figured I can't win. I, I can't get on one of these juries if I if I tried. So that was, so no right to a jury trial. Uh, and so you, because uh, I'll tell you, if you didn't, we used to, I used to go down to Long Beach and uh, that place used to be packed. And that was another problem. I worked for the city prosecutor in Long Beach. So that was, you know, that was, it was just, I could never get on. So I'd end up spending a week, a week there and just I'd bring my lawn chair on the roof of the courthouse so where we'd have them and sit out there and just wait to be called. If you're called, wait to come back. Okay? So, 
Alrighty. So that's the thing that we need to know is just felonies and misdemeanors. And let me, I'll give you a little preview. We're going to have a thing called felony murder. Remember we had that when we talked about the introduction to law? They talked about the four ways to show malice. And one of those, if the death was caused during the perpetration of a felony. So felony murder, that's why it, you can't get somebody for felony murder if they're only committing a misdemeanor. You see? So that's why we have to make sure it's a felony. And so have under involuntary manslaughter, we have such a thing called misdemeanor manslaughter, where it's got to be a misdemeanor. Not an injury. It's got to be a misdemeanor. You see, so it's important that we know the classifications between felonies and misdemeanors. You don't have to worry about the sentencing. You don't care whether they're serving their time. I'm just giving you some background because it's in our case book. Okay? Look at the second paragraph on the bottom of page 95. It is expressly provided in uh, section 19B, this is in the California Penal Code, that an infraction is not punishable by imprisonment and that one charged with an infraction is not entitled to a jury trial nor to assigned counsel if indigent. Okay? <coughs> so, in those cases, you know, you're, you're not... Uh, you're not uh, going to have a jury trial. Things are going to move along very fast. And absolutely they do. Okay. All right. Okay. All righty. Make sure you get that all down. Because I'm probably going to do on the future... When we go through this class, all we're going to talk about is felonies and misdemeanors, okay? Because that's the majority rule. Every jurisdiction has felonies. Every jurisdiction has misdemeanors. Not, not all of them have infractions. Some do, some don't. And it's just not worth because it's we're going to be dealing with, and when we start looking at the types of uh, things that we're dealing with, you'll understand exactly where we're at in time and space. All right, so felonies and misdemeanors. That's, don't worry about it. felonies are serious, misdemeanors are not. And when we we're going to talk a little bit how serious they are. Now, next is our quality of the offense. Now, quality and quality. When you think of quality, you think of it as a positive thing. That it's of good quality. That's not what we mean by quality of the offense. <coughs> what we mean is the essence of the offense. It is either going to be categorized as malum in se or malum prohibitum. Malum in se versus malum prohibitum. It's going to be one or the other. All right? Now, malum in se, now, now there are some Latin terms that we will run across in our study of all three of our cases. There is not many at all, though. Okay, there just isn't. Uh, matter of fact, I, this is one of the only. I'm trying to think of. Oh yeah, there are a couple more, but we'll and we'll have to talk about those right away. But there's like maybe four Latin phrases. Ever so often, when we go to the case books, they'll say some Latin phrases. You know, and I'll explain what they were because a lot of times that's what they use because that was phrases brought these principles into be into their very being when they were in common law during uh, the times of the kings in Great Britain. So malum and say, malum and say, the defini definition of malum and say is that a crime is malum and say if it's evil in itself or it's inherently evil. In other words, if I gave you a crime, and I said, do you think that that is um, malum and say? Do you think it's evil in itself, inherently evil? Well, how do I know? Well, it's either malum and say or malum prohibitum. Malum prohibitum is a crime simply because it's prohibited by statute. Okay? That's what makes it illegal. That's what makes it a crime. Whereas 
Uh, malum and say crime is evil in itself. Now, I want you to remember the time when this all came to be. Common law time, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, even back 1200s. Okay? We had people, uh, it was a time of the Dark Ages. In the Dark Ages, it wasn't called the Dark Ages because there were so many knights, okay? Uh, but it was called the Dark Ages because we actually, as far as learning backwards, we really did. You know, we, we a lot of the people, the, mo the vast majority uh, in England were illiterate. They couldn't read or write, not at all. Whereas that wasn't the case in, in under Roman law, not at all. But in England time, people reverted back to a basic, you know, lazier lifestyle. I don't want to learn how to read. What do we need to read and write for? I can talk. They understand me. As long as I can understand them and they can understand me. Okay. So we didn't have a lot of people that we needed to publish the law. And so, and the, actually, there was no purpose in publishing the law because the vast majority of people couldn't see it. America is known as a land of laws. And the reason they say that, if you ever go to a law library, go look at your local, like California Penal Code, I'm sorry, not California Penal Code, go to the California Codes, and you will see at least two bookshelves filled with books. And that's the codes against everything. The civil codes, we talked about UCC, that'll be in there. We go under their penal code. Part of that penal code, you'll see the vehicle code. Those are all laws that are written down. Okay? And they have to be written down in order for them to basically, uh, as a matter of law, put people on notice that there is a law against that. As long as there is a law that is in effect and it is published and it is published and it is put in libraries, especially the ones that are marked that they are depository, they will receive the law books and they will have the law. And when that happens, everyone is responsible for it. Now, typically, you know, and I know, that when there's always new laws that start up January 1st, you know that. And, uh, and what happens is, many times the local newspapers will tell you, these are the laws that will take effect January 1st. You know, whether it, when, when it became uh, illegal to uh, uh, text and drive in California, I think that was either a January 1st or July 1st. January 1st came along, published, already been published, passed its law. You get stopped by the police. Oh, I didn't know it was a law. Too bad. It was published. You had no ignorance of the law excuses no one. You are guilty. Okay? Now, so that's what we do. We, we have to tell people. You think, do you think texting and driving is malum and say? Is it evil in itself? If it was evil in itself, do we really need to have a, well, do we really need to have it a law? The answer is yes, because it has to be published, put people on notice. And once they're put on notice, now they're responsible. Okay? Now, Malum and Say, again, talk about things that are evil in itself. In other words, they're inherently evil. They're bad. They're bad. And, and, and in common law, early days, we didn't have to tell anybody. Did we have to tell people that robbery was against the law? Do you think that robbery is inherently evil? Taking something from someone by force or threats of force? What do you think? you think that's malum and say, yes or no? Yeah, I think it is. No question about it. How about, about uh, running a stop sign? Or not so much running a stop sign, but doing a California stop on a stop sign. 
In other words, you roll up, you look, you don't see any traffic coming. They have a stop sign too. You don't see anybody at those stop signs, and so you roll through. Is that malum and say? Is that evil in itself? No. Right? No. It's only a crime because it's prohibited by statute. If you do that, do you feel guilty? I don't think so. If you do 10 miles over the speed limit on the freeway, do you feel guilty? No. I mean, you may feel that I always worry about where the cops are at when I'm especially up at 20 miles over the limit, 15, 20, but I don't feel guilty. I just don't want to get caught because it'll cost too much, especially if I have to go to traffic school. Um, the expenses, pleading guilty, paying the fine, paying for the traffic school to avoid my insurance from going up. Okay? That's malum prohibitum. So when we talk about malum and say evil in itself, it means something that, you know what, your conscience could be your guide for malum and say. But it can't be the guide for malum prohibitum. Now in common, the crimes that were there were all malum and say. We didn't have to write them down for two reasons. One, you should consciously know that you shouldn't be doing this. And number two, what good would it be if we wrote it down? You can't read anyways. So we had to depend on that these were crimes that were malum and say. Now, if you ever have a problem with determining whether malum is malum and say or malum prohibitum, take a child, for example. Try to reduce it down to a child. You know, especially in the one and a half, two, three year group. You got them a... Um, uh, a kid that goes up to another kid at the playground, they're playing in the sandbox, and you've got this kid that goes up to another kid who's playing with his toys, his little tractor in the sand, and this kid comes up to that kid and grabs his tractor from him and wrestles it from him. Now, what's the parents doing? Well, the parents typically are going to say, stop that. You and the parents of that child that took it away, they usually say something like, you know you shouldn't take things that don't belong to you. Well, how do they know that? Because it's like robbery. Taking something from somebody else by force is robbery. So this is kind of like a mini version of it. It's malum and say, your child should know better, right? And if you ever go to uh, a park, and whether it's your kids or some other kids, some kid typically always ends up biting another kid. And I understand why. Uh, when, when you have kids that don't have uh, any type of extended vocabulary, when they're kind of left out of the fun or they're being treated right, they can't verbalize what the problem is, and so they do what they only can do, and that is bite. Okay, so that's how they eat it. You know, just like little, little kids, you know, a couple of month old children from newborn on a ways, when they need something, they cry. That's because the only way that they can communicate. So when you hear a baby cry, uh, you usually figure, okay, we got either a diaper problem, we got a hunger problem, uh, we've got something, they're just not feeling good, okay? They could be having a fever, just aches. We don't know, but that cry tells us they need attention for something. That's the only way they can do it. And so some kids, as they grow up and they can't vocalize, uh, they end up biting somebody. Now, if you are the parent or you're not the parent, I mean, you, you'd never want to be that parent, right? Thankfully, I never was. But I'm just saying is that that's, I've seen kids where they bite people. I mean, they leave marks on these kids' arms and stuff, okay? Now, you would see the parents come up and typically say, you know better. You should never bite anyone, okay? And you're talking to kids that understand, two years old and stuff like that. They should know. Why should they know? Because... Hopefully, it's part of their moral fabric. And biting is inherently evil. 
it's evil in itself. It's not wrong just because I told you it's wrong. It's wrong because you should feel guilty biting someone, right? Now, let me give you another example. You're um, home one day and you get a phone call. And it's your 22-year-old son or daughter. They're calling you from the police station. They have been arrested for DUI. And you're not very happy about that, kind of disappointed a little bit. But you go down there, it's your child. And you go down there and you say, what were you thinking? And their answer is, well, you never told me that I shouldn't drink and drive. And maybe you never, you don't drink. Or maybe you don't drink and drive. Now, is that a legitimate answer from your kid? And the answer probably is no. You typically should come back with an answer that says, you know better. Well, how do they know better? Because driving while intoxicated is considered inherently evil. It's evil in itself. It's not mal prohibitum. Sure, they may not feel guilty driving while intoxicated. That's because of the intoxication. But anybody else out there, you got to say, you know, I see people driving while intoxicated. It infuriates me. Why? Because I've got a wife, I've got a son, and I've got a daughter that are out there on the roads. And I don't need some drunk to kill them and then cry and tell me how sorry they were. Okay? Not at all. I, I don't need any of that. As far as I'm concerned, I, I would love to have DUI a minimum. You caught DUI, you're in jail. Full thing of the misdemeanor. None of this California, anybody who gets a DUI, their first DUI, gets reduced down to a wet reckless, which means it's reckless driving, but it doesn't say driving while intoxicated. It's in there that it, it's a wet reckless, but it's not a DUI. It does count as a prior when you get again, but why do we give them more chances to go out and do it? First time, you know, what are you gonna do? Wait for somebody to kill somebody? You don't want that. Usually, and the drunk never dies. The drunk always is the one to make it through. Uh, but so, you know, is it malum and say evil in itself? All right, then, then it's malum and say. If it's malum prohibitive simply because it's prohibited by statute, then we've uh, you've got it. So if you're telling your kid, well, hey, what are you doing? In the, what are you doing in the uh, the sandbox? It's after six o'clock in the evening, and they close this child's park at six o'clock because they don't want the teenagers hanging out here, uh, drinking, uh, doing other things, leaving brought bottles in there, broken bottles in the sandbox. So they close it at six o'clock. So you tell your kid, what are you doing here at 6 o'clock? I didn't know it was, I had to close at 6. See, that's malaprohibitive. There's no reason that you would know that it closed at 6 o'clock. Speeding, 5, 10 miles over. Now, this may be a time when it may transfer, start off as malaprohibitive, but go to malum and say. 10 miles over the limit, malum, over the limit, malaprohibitive. 30 over the limit in a residential area, in other words, let's say the residential area is 25 miles an hour, and you're doing 55 in a residential uh, uh, residential area. Is that simply malum prohibitive, or is that malum and say? You see, 40 over the limit, doing 65 in a residential area next to a school. Let's juice it up a little bit, okay? An elementary school. That's even better, okay? During recess, okay? 65 and a 20. Well, that'd be a 20 zone, all right? Malum and say, malum prohibitum. You see, there's got to be a time when it switches over from malum prohibitum to malum and say. Where does it switch over? I'm not sure. But that's what the juries have to decide. Is it malum and say? Is it malum prohibitum? Because we're going to come to a part in our homicides where in order for someone to be liable for misdemeanor manslaughter, that misdemeanor has to be malum and say, not merely malum prohibitum. And so that's why we need this analysis. Okay?
And that's where it really, that's, I mean, to tell you the truth, that's about the only place it comes in that you will ever use these, these Latin words will be in misdemeanor manslaughter, right? Okay, let's go over to our next stop, which is the sources of criminal law. Sources of criminal law. Matter of fact, let me grab out my dictionary. Barron's Dictionary, Barron's Dictionary, and Black's Little Dictionary. I got some 10th uh, Centennial Edition, whatever it is, okay? But when we look at, first off, when we look at common law, what do we mean by common law, okay? Common law says in uh, Barron's, common law, the system of jurisprudence, we know what jurisprudence is, juris meaning law, prudence meaning philosophy, so it's a philosophy of law, the system of uh, philosophy of law, which originated in England and was law applied in the United States, which is based on judicial precedent rather than statutory laws, which are legislative enactments. It is to be uh, contrasted with civil law, uh, the descendant of Roman law prevalent in other Western countries, originally based on the unwritten laws of England. The common law is generally derived from principles rather than rules. But this one little part, originally derived on the unwritten laws of England. Quite a long time ago, right? But what they talk about is judge-made law. Just check out what uh, Black's got to say about that, okay? Black says, under common law, it's French, um, and the body of law derived from judicial decisions rather than from statutes or constitution. Then it has federal common law, general federal common law, common law crime, common law dedication. So the both of the books, their first definition is Common law meaning a law that is judicially, as judicial originations or judge-made law. That's not what we're going to mean. When we talk about common law, common law, let's say burglary. We talk about common law burglary. We want to talk about that law when it was unwritten. In other words, we want to talk about old law. Because judges, if you've read that book, Judicial... Um, what is it? Judicial process, you'll see the judges make laws all the time. Okay? They not only interpret the laws, but by interpreting them, they say what it means. All right? So you have certain things uh, that, that come up. You look at some of the Supreme Court decisions. Well, that's the law. Can't do anything about that now. That's the law. Well, yeah, but wait a minute. That wasn't the law back then. Well, it doesn't matter. Judge made law. It's current law. It's good. So when we talk about in our context of criminal law, when we talk about common law, we mean the law that was in effect probably around the time of the revolution. Okay? Because that's kind of the law that we adopted. We did. We had the common law and we didn't mind the common law, and we saw that in introduction to law, we talked about the reception statutes, that the common law of England at the time of the revolution would be the laws at which would be. So the second meaning for common law is law that is in effect at the revolution, a time, as we talked about, a time where it was the unwritten law. Didn't have to write it down. Because, first of all, all the crimes were malum in se. So you, you don't have to say, well, I didn't see that written down that I can't kill my neighbor. We don't need to write that down. That's malum in se. It's evil in itself to kill somebody. Murder. That's malum in se. Okay? So common law, law that was in effect at the revolution, that's one that we're going to be concentrating on. So make sure that you can mark that one. We also have early common law. So there'll be times when we will say, 
well, in early common law, this, that, and the other. What do we mean by that? Well, early common law, 12th through the 14th century. Okay? And that is more, we don't really derive our law from that. The principles that we're going to be dealing with are the common law ones, not the early common law. But sometimes we will talk about early common law because that set the groundwork. A lot of our stuff is like that. We also have majority rule. Now, what's majority rule? It's at least 26 of the 51 jurisdictions. And the minority is a high number is considered a significant minority. You got 20 states, 24 states that follow a particular rule. That's that's a that's a significant minority. Okay. Now, when we start talking about the majority rule, we've already started talking a little bit about that in torts, contracts, and most of the rules I give you are the majority rules. We talked about the restatement, right? The restatement is a restatement of the majority rule with some politics involved. Okay. Now, the majority rule in America, and that's what we're talking about, not in England, not in the common law jurisdictions. We're talking about England. We start off with a common law because at the time of the founding of our country, common law in England it was established. And it was also being used in our colonies. We were comfortable with the law. We were revolting because of the misuse of the law against citizens of the crown. Read the Declaration of Independence, please. Take some time and read the Declaration of Independence. When you read through it, you will realize these things that were being done to the colonists that shouldn't have been happening. They were British citizens too. They believed that they had the right to certain rights and liberties that were afforded to all other Englishmen. Yet they were being denied to the colonists. And so because of that, the colonists felt, and, and let me just tell you the, my view on it, the colonists, if you read the Declaration of, a, of Independence, think of it as a uh, a cause of action against England for breach of contract. If you ever get a chance, if you can kind of get through it, read the Magna Carta. Magna Carta has got some older English, and so we're talking about early uh, common law. So try to look through the early common law and be able to try to look through some of the, the words. And some of it are, are hard to understand what they're, what they're saying. Uh, but trying to get through it, muddle through that Magna Carta. And it's a contract between uh, King John and the English lords and the citizens, uh, the Englishmen. And one of the main things was that it said that the king was not above the law. So the king just could not make rules and not have to worry about breaking any laws because he was the king. Now, we'll see a carryover to that when we get into torts later on, where there's immunity, where the government has immunity against lawsuits, and states have immunity against lawsuits at one time. And it was based on the principle, the old common law principle, that the king can do no wrong. So you could never sue the king because you thought the king did something wrong. Uh, just, just couldn't do that. It was impossible. Because the king can do no wrong. He's the one that makes the laws. He can change them anytime he wants to. Okay? So when we get to the common law, there are certain principles laid down by the time of the revolution, certain principles laid down, and that we enjoy them. Colonists enjoyed those laws. They liked contracts. And they realized that the Magna Carta was a type of contract that the king had with the people. 
But at the time of the revolution, or just before that, were instances of breach of contract. And if you read that in Declaration of Independence, if you can get through the Magna Carta, get through the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence lays out the breaches that were made by the King of England against the colonists. And so what they felt was that you have breached our contract that we have had with each other, with the king has had with Englishmen for hundreds of years. And we feel that as a remedy for the breach, we can break all our ties and we can become independent. We are no longer under your control because as part of the agreement was, if we are your subjects, you have to treat us with the respect that the law requires. You are not treating us with the respect that the law requires. So therefore, we are no longer your subjects, and this land is longer your land. And as a remedy of breach, as the Declaration of Independence says, that the people not only have the right to revolt, they have the duty to revolt. And so if you look at the Declaration of Independence, as showing the world that we had a contract and the King of England breached that contract and our, we are no longer English servants and this new land is our land. We're the ones that settled it. This is where we live. England has no right to it. We are declaring our independence. And if you read the declaration, you will see a lot of things that were going on to the, the colony. And especially if you ever read any type of history dealing with Constitution, and especially the Bill of Rights, the first eight amendments, you will see why each one of those amendments were there because of the misuse by the king and the British government against the colonists. They would grab somebody in, in America throw them on a ship, take them to England, put them in jail for a couple of months, decide to have a trial, or maybe said, you know what, no, we're not going to have a trial. Take them back, two months ride, two months there, two months jail time, two months back, two months ride, ride them back. And so six months later, this guy shows up back on the shores of America. Where'd you go? They took me to England, kept me in prison, they let me go. So you've been gone for six months for no reason? No. So that's why you will see how we have that right to a fast and public trial, a speedy trial, they call it. Speedy and public trial. Why? Because they were abusing that right. So get a chance. When you look to the Declaration of Independence and you read the stuff about the Constitution and you realize what the founders did in the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights was, and there were actually two people, the Federalists, and um, there's Madison and, um, um, who's the other, Madison, and there are two Virginians. Well, they wanted, wasn't Hamilton. But the Federalists did not want a Bill of Rights. And the reason that they didn't want a Bill of Rights, it, it's Mason. It's Madison and Mason. Those are the two. The reason that the, the Federalists did not want a Bill of Rights was because they said, if we start naming certain things that the government can't do, there may come a time when the government feels like, okay, they told us what we can't do, so everything else we can do. And the Federalists said, don't put a Bill of Rights. Why do we have to tell them that there shall be no illegal certain seizures when the government ne never had a right to illegally seize? And so why do I have to tell the government they can't do that? Because they've never had that right. But if I put it in the if I put it in the amendments, now they'll think, well, as long as I can get around this, 
then I'm okay. And you know what? That is exactly what happens today. When a person gets stopped and they are searched, they will always say this violation of the Fourth Amendment. Why should they do that? In other words, there doesn't have to be an amendment to say the government can't do it. The government doesn't have the right to do it, never did. So you could just say the Constitution never gives the government that right, and so therefore it was an unconstitutional search and seizure. Forget about the Fourth Amendment. That's what the Federalists were always afraid of. If it's in that, if it's in those uh, first eight amendments, well, then you know what? The government can't. But if it's not in there, we can do it. No, that's not the way it works. They say we have our eighth amendment, prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. So the government said, well, uh, what we do here is that. We are going to execute people by firing squad. Well, isn't that cruel? Yeah, maybe, but it's not unusual. People were killed by firing squad for many years. Or we want to hang people. Yeah, that gas chamber, electrocution, old Sparky down in Florida. Yeah, that's, that's okay. But a good old hanging, there's like somebody dying and dancing at the end of a rope. Okay? A lot more entertainment there. I want entertainment value. So let's start hanging people. Well, no, that's cruel to hang them. Yeah, but it's not unusual. They have been hanging people in England for centuries. And in order to be under the cruel and unusual, it's got to be the and. And it's got to be cruel and unusual. Okay? Minnesota got rid of the death penalty because it was, they felt it was cruel. And under the Minnesota Constitution, it was something could be unconstitutional if it, the punishment is cruel or unusual. But that's not the U.S. Constitution. It's cruel and unusual. But, but again, do we have to nitpick those words? No. It could be cruel or because the government doesn't have, does not have any right to cruelly execute one, no matter how usual it is okay you see when you start having those rules just as the federalists thought they would be if you start laying out certain things they can't do then the government will believe they can do everything else and whenever you see people claiming things they'll claim well i have a first amendment right of free speech wait a minute the government even before the first amendment was signed in the government never had a right to prohibit your free speech. Second article, I mean, article two, that you have a right to keep and bear arms. Oh, now we've got to take all kinds of time and figure out what do we mean by keep and bear arms? When we talk about that the people have this right, are we talking about a militia? Do we mean people collectively or do we mean people individually? Well, to me, it's irrelevant. The government never had the right to prohibit citizens from having guns. Never had that right. It was just one of the enumerated ones. And so the government has taken that position. Unless the Second Amendment prohibits the government from doing certain things, then the government can do it. And that is not what the law is. That's never what the Constitution ever was intended to do. So the Federalists did not want the Bill of Rights. But you know what? They would have never passed the Constitution if they weren't told that a Bill of Rights had to be included. And so that's how they passed the Constitution, got it through the states, and followed up by the Bill of Rights. Okay? But if you read some of the Federalist papers, especially on the Bill of Rights, you, it, it happened exactly as they predicted it would happen. That they used it as, oh, these are, all, these are the only restrictions on the federal government. It's not what the Bill of Rights is. 
What we're doing is enumerating some because there were so many instances of that. Now, one of the things we've never used the Third Amendment, the quartering of soldiers, we've never had that. Okay? But the First Amendment, right? Free speech, freedom of religion, not having a national religion. Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. Fourth Amendment, illegal search and seizures. Fifth Amendment, double jeopardy. Not have to be a witness against yourself. There's your Miranda. Sixth Amendment, right to an attorney. Seventh Amendment, you can't be, uh, you have the right to confront witnesses that are against you. Confrontation clause. Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. Many other things, okay? You'll learn that in, in con law, hopefully. Okay? So, but the, the sources of the law are the early common law. I mean, I'm sorry, not the early common law. The common law, but that was in effect at the time of the revolution, with the majority rule changes. Now, when we talk about majority rule, what we do is we look at the number of jurisdictions. And they say, well, you know, every jurisdiction does this except five. Well, can you tell me who those five are? Well, California, New York, Texas, Illinois, and Florida. Wait a minute. You, you tell me those again? Sure. California, Texas, New York, Illinois, and Florida. They constitute probably the majority of citizens in the United States. Yet, that would be considered a very small minority, five out of 51. Remember, there's 51 jurisdictions because we have the 50 states plus the federal government is a sovereign jurisdiction. You see, so that we just go by the numbers. So when we talk about majority rule, what do we do? I mean, California alone, if it was the only one that had it, that would be a significant minority. All right. All right. Now, what else do we have? Well, of course, we have the Model Penal Code, MPC, uh, produced by the American Law Institute. Uh, just as we talked in criminal law, I mean, in contracts about the UCC, how the UCC came into being, and the UCC was readily adopted by almost every state. The only state that didn't adopt it was Louisiana, mainly because the UCC had a lot of common law underpinnings where the Louisiana was under Napoleonic Code, civil law. So that's why the UCC doesn't fit that. And Model Penal Code, the ALI helped work on the UCC, try to make uniform law. Well, that's what the Model Penal Code tried to do. Let's make penal code that is uniform throughout the country. You gotta remember, under England, the law was uniform throughout the country because there was just federal law, the King's Law, that was it. Very little regional law. When common law came into being, that was the law in England, period. We don't have that here. We don't have a federal law that covers all states because each state was sovereign. You see, when England came, especially with the Magna Carta, was all of the lords had their small sections or their large sections of England. And they joined together to protect and protect the king. And they're the ones that supplied the armies. Of course, they're the ones that had the power. And that's why they went to King John and said, you signed that Magna Carta, almost at the edge of the sword. Because if you do, you don't have an army. We are your army. You may have a small standing army, but when you take all the rest of it, we could overrun you and get rid of the king so fast. Okay? So at that time, England had a common law. It was common in the realm. That's what makes the reason the word called a law. Okay? That's what the Model Penal Code wanted to do. That's what the UCC wanted to do. UCC was readily adopted because it made commerce throughout the country logical plus uniform. You call somebody, you tell them you want to do this. What does it mean under the UCC you want to buy some goods? Okay? That's easy. 
But the model penal code, people didn't like that. You know, the model penal code was sometimes in some aspects very liberal, some aspects very conservative. That was the problem that they had. People just didn't like it completely. Some jurisdictions adopted it. Other jurisdictions adopted it. Then they went back to their old rules. Remember, you got you got to put in a model penal code. We're going to talk about this when we get to we talk about mens rea, another Latin phrase. Um, we're going to talk about what the model penal code didn't like about common law. And when you look at it, it really doesn't make much sense. And there's such a possibility bringing in new law requires new cases in front of the Supreme Court to interpret that law. And I think a lot of the states said, you know what? We're happy with the common law. We have got the common law. We've made some changes, tweaks, little tweaks here and there. Okay with that. And we don't need to put the Supreme Court and the appellate courts through such work that their, their calendars will be completely clawed because we have new laws to interpret. What do we mean by this? What do we mean by that? So model penal code, although it's a source of criminal law, it's, it's a low source that we will not be dealing with. All right, so don't worry about it. For a number of jurisdictions, for a number of reasons. The reason why I don't want you to worry about the model penal code, <coughs> there's only going to be two exceptions to that. One is the model penal code on insanity, the ALI test. You should have some passing knowledge of some of the elements. And number two is the unilateral theory of the model penal code, unilateral theory on conspiracy. And that would be only for essays. As to the model penal code, you see a section in the book that starts talking about the model penal code. Don't even touch it. Don't waste your time. I don't want things to enter your brain that under exam pressure, you'll remember reading something somewhere thinking it's the right answer, where if it's the model penal code, the chances are it's the wrong answer, okay? Now, the reason I also reason why I don't want you to know the model penal code is, number one, the model penal code is not tested on any of my exams. The model penal code is not tested on the baby model. The model penal code is not tested on the general bar exam. The model penal code is not the law in California. Well, once you become an attorney, if you're gonna practice criminal law, it definitely won't be the model penal code. All right? So if you don't need it to become an attorney as far as tests go, and then once you become an attorney, you won't need it in this jurisdiction, why am I gonna waste your time and your gray matter learning stuff that is not relevant to you. I won't do that, okay? Although you can see by this author, and let me just tell you, this, this author is one of the few that, don't, that doesn't really push the penal code, yet after most sections, they usually have a reprint of the model penal code, and they usually have the reprint of some of the bigger jurisdictions, California, New York, things of that such. So when you look through here, you may see that, wait a minute, you know, I see this model penal code is here and it's here and it's here. Yeah, like I said, don't waste your time with it. If there's any part that has any significance, I will let you know, okay? All right, that's what I'm here for. That's why I'm getting paid the money I'm getting paid, all right? And the last source of criminal law is California law, the California Penal Code. Now. Nowhere on any of my exams are you going to have to know what the California Penal Code is. On the baby bar, no California Penal Code. Remember we looked at that exam? What did that exam say? Remember we talked about that a couple of weeks ago? Actually, about what, last week was the torts. Last week was contracts. The week before that was the legal research, and we did that essay workshop. So three weeks ago, we talked about what that says on the front of the booklet for the exam for the baby bar, that you should use rules of general applicability. I mean, California, they're not asking. You should never be writing California on any, on any criminal law test for my class, for the baby bar, 
or for the general bar because it's not required. Now, when you get to the general bar, it will tell you that unless the question specifically asks for California law, you are to apply rules of general applicability. Now, there are some that are. There are wills asked for California law, community property, California law, evidence, California law, okay? Professional responsibility, California law. But no contracts question, no torts question, no criminal law question will ever ask for what is the California rules, all right? Or they will ever put you in a situation where they'll say, the following occurred in the state of California. Never, never will happen, okay? Now, out of these, what are you gonna need to know? Let's say that I gave you a test on burglary. And you wanted to see if the facts match the rules. Okay, well, what was the common law rule for burglary? What was the early common law? What's the majority rule for common law? And significant minorities out there? What's the model penal code? I guarantee you they have a statute for a burglary and it's not the same as common law. What's the California penal code for burglary? So if I ask you that, am I expecting an answer under all of these laws? And the answer is no. The ones that you are going to be responsible for are, is, will be the common law, okay? And it's the number two definition. So you got to know what the law, when I talk about common law burglary, I don't want to know about what judge made law is. I want to know what was it at the time of the revolution. And then, but I want you to also tell me certain things we're going to be dealing with the majority rule. So they're going to be responsible for mostly the common law with majority rule changes. And nowhere is that more evident than in homicide. And no more evident is in felony murder. We have a lot of limitations on the felony murder rule. And it's the majority rule we want to know. And we'll, I'll tell you what it was at, at common law. And there were very little limitations at all. Now there's a lot. And because it's a majority rule, and, and I'll explain why that happens. People disfavor, courts disfavor the uh, felony murder rule. Okay, we'll talk about why. And so what they've done to try to ease up uh, the effect of having the felony murder rule by certain judicial decisions. And that's where those majority rules come in. So that's what we're going to be limited to. And I'll tell you, that's not that much rule. And I am going to give you, as we do our outline, just like I'm doing now, when I give you, when we get to burglary, I will give you that common law definition. Okay? Burglary is a great one because there's two types of burglary that you're going to be responsible for. What's the common law burglary? And what is the modern or statutory burglary? Okay? And let me just tell you, on the multiple choice questions that you will get, they follow the common law rules for burglary. A lot more elements, a lot more ways to find the defendant not guilty. Okay? They're never going to ask you about the model penal code of burglary. They're never going to ask you California because they can't. The choice questions on the general bar, that test, multi-state bar exam, called multi-state for numerous reasons. One of it's it's multi-statements. There's A, B, C, and D. But then also it is used in multiple states, multiple jurisdictions. It's used in every jurisdiction except Washington State and Louisiana. All the rest are have multi-states. Indiana ha didn't have it for a while, but I, I think they've got, got that now. But even the D.C., which is that 51 jurisdictions. 
So there's really only two jurisdictions that don't use the multi-states. So that's why they couldn't test you on California law or New York law. Because what would all the other states do? Say, well, we didn't learn New York law in law school. We didn't learn California law. I went to, the, I went to law school in Nebraska. So, okay. So common law, majority rule. And as, I, as we do multiple choice questions, as we do on the chat sessions, what I use for those questions are pass bar questions. So you're going to see how the bar asks questions, how they word it, and what is the law that I've been, I'll be teaching you in our sessions like this. This is what, how do we take that law, now that we've learned that kind of know the words, uh, how does it really apply to facts? Let's see where the rubber meets the road. And that's what the chat sessions are all about. We go through multiple choice questions. And when I do that, when I go through them, we may only go through four, six, seven questions in an hour. Now, that's in, in the timing for it, the bar requires you to do a question 1.8 minutes. Okay? So uh, if I'm doing 10, you're doing what, 18 minutes, five of them, nine minutes? And we're spending an hour? Yeah. Why? Because we talk about the approaches, what they're asking, what the rules are that we've previously learned, how do they apply, why the right answer is right, why the wrong answer is wrong. When you walk out of that chat session, you'll know why that right answer is right. And I will stick with you until you don't do understand. Okay, I'm here to help. That's why some people say, oh, well, well, I could make the chat session. Just tell me the answers. I tell them, no, I don't. I will not give you the answers. Why? Because you got to listen to the lecture. All right? Uh, the first answer was the answer for question number one was A. Well, that's what you got it for. Did you get it and say, well, yeah, you know, I kind of guessed at that. What was your other choice? D, A or D? So I kind of flipped the coin and went with A. So if you flipped it again, you might go with D, right? But if you listen to the explanation, you would always go with A. You'd never. You'd understand why A is the right answer, not just a guess, and why D shouldn't even been considered, shouldn't even been part of, shouldn't even been on that coin. Okay? And that's important. If you don't go to the chat sessions, make sure that you watch them on archive. That's why I hope. Hopefully, I'm going to be able to get your exams, your multiple choice, and your essays a week to two weeks early, so that way when you have your little chats, your little uh, study groups, that you guys can either use those as part of your study group, your essays, your multiple choice, and then when we get to class. Because there's been many times I've come into those chat sessions where the students will say, yeah, you know, this is one of the questions that we struggle with in our chat session. Fine. That's what we're here for. Let's, let's, let's do it, okay? All righty. Let us move on. All right, so there's your sources of criminal law. Now, common law felonies. Now, as we talked, as we talked earlier, when you look at all of the laws, all of the crimes that we have in California and the United States, huge amount of, we have thousands and thousands of felonies. England, nine. Nine felonies. That's it. Okay? And I may give you a little mnemonic. Mr. Mrs. Lamb. All right? They are murder, robbery, manslaughter, rape, sodomy, larceny, arson, mayhem, and burglary. And we'll go through most of them. We don't deal with sodomy. Uh, and, and I'll explain when we get into some of the sexual crimes and rape and whatnot. I'll explain why. Okay? So those are the nine common law felonies. Now, one thing about them, all, well, while well, you're writing, write those down.
If you look over page 95 <clears throat> for felony, uh, note number 56, note number 56, it says in the words of Blackstone. Now, Blackstone was, uh, uh, he wrote Blackstone commentaries. And what Blackstone did was Blackstone, Hale, um, also uh, Cook, although the word looks like it's pronounced Coke, uh, it's C-O-K-E, but it's pronounced Cook. So Cook, Blackstone, and Hale were very instrumental in uh, the preservation of the common law. They wrote down what the laws were at the time. Otherwise, without them, we would not know what the common law was. And so the Black Blackstone is, is one of the more famous Blackstone commentaries, is the commentaries on the common law. And if you look, number 56, in the words of Blackstone, very weighty words, the true criterion of felony <clears throat> is forfeiture. Now, when we mean forfeiture, we mean complete forfeiture. If a person was convicted of any of these felonies, then he forfeited his life, his land, and his property. Life, land, and property. And if it was the husband that was convicted of the felony, the property was controlled by him. If he was married with children, they became penniless. They took the person's life, they hung the person, they would take away his land, and they would take the land and give it to the Lord that was the local Lord, and then the Lord could do what he wanted with the land. And if he had any money, livestock, property, it took everything. That's why <clears throat> when we look at torts, we've been starting with torts, a lot of common law things going on there. Well, one of the problems was if you were a victim of a robbery or a burglary, they broke on your land, that's trespass to land, let's sue them for trespass to land. You weren't going to get a lawsuit or trespass to land. And you know why? Because everything he owned went to the Lord. There was nothing for the lawsuit. He's penniless. Okay? Now, <clears throat> one of the other felony, remember treason, earlier treason? Treason, there was forfeiture also, complete. Forfeiture of life, land, and property. But if it was treason, the property went to the king. That's the procedural difference that it talked about. The Lord got any of the other ones, but when it came to treason, that went to the king. Okay? Now, so all of these were malum and say. I mean, isn't it evil in itself to murder someone or to commit manslaughter, or robbery, or rape, or larceny, or sodomy, or arson, mayhem, or burglary? Burn someone's house down? Mayhem? Yeah, it's not the guy from the Allstate commercial, okay? Mayhem is dismemberment disablement of a bodily part or disfigurement, throwing acid in someone's face. I don't think if someone commits that, that this person is going to say, well, oh, yeah, that? I didn't know that was against the law. I Yeah, I chopped the guy's arm off, but you know what? I He lived. I, I didn't think it was against the law. Yeah, really? Burglary, breaking into someone's house to commit a crime. Arson, burning someone's home down. <clears throat> You know, arson was considered the crime that went only to homicide, murder, and slaughter. Arson was a very terrible crime. Why? Most people lived in rural areas. Oh, your house burned down. Well, I'll call my insurance company. Eh, we'll get you settled. Go into the into go over to, there's a Motel Six. Probably back then it was a Motel One. Okay, go into the Motel One and then you you know just get a room. Tell them that. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to take care of you with insurance. No, that didn't happen. There were no motels. You burned down a person's dwelling. And there was a time was instead of hanging you, they burnt you to death. Okay? Definitely let the punishment fit the crime. All of these were malum and say, and they were all capital offenses. 
Now, larceny, <clears throat> that's stealing. What should you have to steal to be considered larceny? Well, if it was anything over a quarter, they would hang you. Wow. Uh, I think that would keep shoplifting down, I think that's for sure. Over on page 94, <clears throat> if you look over on page, on note number uh, 55, um, it says whipping was substituted for death as the penalty for petite larceny, or sometimes we call it petty larceny. But this was a change from the common law resulting from an early statute. Now, it's still a felony. It's just that they didn't hang you. And that's so if you if you only if you stole 20 cents, eh, they're gonna whip you. Still be guilty of a felony, <clears throat> but no forfeiture of life. Okay. And if you read about larceny and when we get into the theft crimes, you're gonna see that larceny was considered a very serious crime. Because people lived in communities, and communities were about communities. And if someone within the community was stealing, that's very bad. That's distrust. That's like a family member abusing a trust of another family member. It's bad. It's not good. And so larceny was considered a serious crime simply because of the, of the implications of the lack of trust, the lack of uh, breaking up of the community, okay? All right, so there's your common law felonies, <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Lamb. Like I said, we'll start going through some of those. All right. All righty. And if you know, if I, if I go too fast, as I go through my notes, uh, let me tell you what you can do. You can um, go home and have a pity party. No. No, if I go too fast, usually usually just quickly throw something up on the text, go back, slow down. You know, I get excited about this stuff. This stuff is exciting. You know, like criminal law is. It's fast and quick. It's it's nice. It's dirty. And it's, 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 it's awesome. You, know, you get a criminal law case, they go fast. These civil cases drag on forever with all kinds of discovery. You don't have that for criminal law. No, it's fast. Right? And um, so if I go too fast, you just put up a note. Uh, you'll see other people do that. You know, go back, I'll move to the next slide. And people say, no, no, go back. So I'll go back and I'll give you time to do it. Or after the class is over, and this also applies if you happen to come in a little late. Let's say you come in late, and we're already on page three of the handout, and you're saying, oh, I must have missed quite a bit. How am I ever going to make this up? I can't tell the guy to go back. After I'm done with the class, there is, a, because I'm recording this, as you see, it says recording on there. Uh, the recording is happening on Mega Meetings website. That's where those, the file is kept. When I am done with my class, when I hit the stop recording, Mega Meeting gives me, just me, uh, doesn't show up on your screen, gives me a link to a file. And I go and on the web page, the site, the student center, where you went and got the handout for tonight's class, you're going to see that there's going to be there a thing, a link says streaming video. And I will put that up right after class. So if you came in late, don't worry about it. When class is over, the streaming video is up there. You click on it. It will stream the video from the very beginning. And it has a little bar on the top where you can move it ahead. <clears throat> and it works. It just You just have to wait because when you stream it, it has to go over to that place. But if you just missed the first 10, 15 minutes, you just put up that streaming video, sit down with your pen, and write. Plus, there's a pause. So if you're writing along and say, wait, let me get this down, hit pause. Yeah, you know, let me go get a cup of coffee. It's getting late. Go get a cup of coffee, come back, hit play. Right where you left off. Okay? And then what I do is uh, hopefully by tomorrow, which day is Monday, tomorrow will be Tuesday. Tuesday by 5 o'clock Pacific time, 
that streaming video will be gone off there and it will be replaced by two downloadable files. One MP3 audio only and one is an MP4 audio and video that you can download onto your computer and then watch it and then when you pull it up you can move that um, indicator everywhere you want. So if you're missing say don't worry I download all my stuff I'll just download that tomorrow night I'll get the part that I was missing and I'll fill it in so that's a way you can do it too if you think that you know well I'm just a slow typist um, I'll just wait for tomorrow I'll just put a little mark here let me know that I've got to download that mp4 move it up to that area see what needs to be written and I'll write it down then you can pause it all right has all the features that you need. All right. All right. <clears throat> now, let us go to the burden of proof. Burden of proof. Proof. In other words, who has that burden of proof? Well, first off, we start off with this presumption of innocence. Now, presumption of, to me is uh, somewhat fictional. Okay. Eh, no question about it. I mean, you see, when, when somebody, let's say there was a murder that happened, and they have a person in custody, and you say, hey, did you hear what happened? The, the mayor was shot. Oh, yeah, yeah, but they got the guy in custody. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. No, they got a guy in custody, and there's a presumption that he didn't do it. So they don't have the guy in custody. What are you talking about? They got a guy in custody? I got to have faith that the police are doing their job, that they're only going to try to arrest somebody that they can convict. So therefore, there's got to be enough evidence. Well, wait a minute. So where's the presumption of innocence? You've already convicted this guy before trial. Where's the presumption? That's what I'm saying. Presumption of innocence is kind of fictional. You know? American jurisprudence requires um, that the accused be afforded the presumption that they are innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, right. All right. I got a buddy, an attorney, and um, he was called for jury duty and a uh, criminal case. And um, uh, they, the judge asked him, do you think you'd have any problem uh, dealing with this case? And he goes, yeah, I do have problems. I've got some friends that are uh, Long Beach policemen, and I have to put some faith in the police department. Maybe every single cop isn't 100% pure and innocent and uh, dedicated to his job, but I've got to believe the vast majority are. And the vast majority of people are not going to frame somebody. And so when I see a police officer arrest somebody, I have to presume that they would not arrest that person unless they had a really good belief that this guy did it. And because I have them, I have faith in their judgment. They're the ones that were there. They're the ones that had the evidence. They're the ones that know all the little things. So I've got to presume that this guy is guilty. And there's nothing you can do, Judge, to force me to presume innocence. Because I just can't. I'm not wired that way. Okay? And he always gets kicked off juries. <laughs> but that's what we do in America. All right? Let's go over. I get kicked off juries. But look over page 10. Okay? Over on page 10, uh, paragraph number 2. The reasonable doubt standard plays a vital role in the American scheme of criminal procedure. It is the prime instrument for reducing the risk of convictions resting on factual error. The standard provides concrete substance for the presumption of innocence, that bedrock and elementary principle whose enforcement lies at the foundation of the administration of our criminal law. Let me tell you, you ever want to, you do a criminal case, you have got to stress to the jury. You have to tell them. And I've done this. I've done a couple of criminal cases where I've had to tell the jurors as I bore dared where they interview them. 
uh, I've told them, or also in my opening remarks, I will tell them that I want you to treat the defendant as you would want to be treated. If you were up here, we first we have the presumption of innocence. So if you were here, and let's say that you believed him, but how do we convince the jury? Well, the answer is you don't have to convince the jury. The jury should start from the premise that you are innocent. And the entire burden of proving your guilt is on the state. So we don't start with the guy's probably guilty and he did it. And let's see what the state can do and hope they don't screw it up too bad. All right? That's not the way it works. The presumption is that your client, your defendant, is absolutely not guilty. There's no reason for you to believe that he's guilty. And in civil cases, the plaintiff has the burden of proof, as in contracts and torts. But in criminal cases, the state has the burden of proof. We have the presumption of innocence, but now the state wants to hold this guy, find him guilty of burglary, then the state has to prove each and every element. Because the presumption is the defendant never did one of those elements. And so when the, uh, the, the state starts putting on witnesses, what you look for is, does the state put on a witness to satisfy this element? Satisfy this element, this element, this element. That's what the defense attorney has to be there. So you don't want your defendant to be convicted if the prosecution hasn't proved the case. Okay? Because that's the burden. We start off with the presumption, and that's one of the things that you have to drive home to the jury, that if you were sitting in this chair, how would you want to be treated by the jury? Did you, would you want to be presumed innocent as the law requires? And that the state has to prove every element of the crime that the defendant is accused of committing. You know, and that's why you'll see, we'll talk about the alleged shooter, okay? Because they can't say the shooter is in custody. No, they can't say that. Because it's presumed he didn't do the shooting until they prove it. And that's why typically they ask for a plea, it's not guilty. Because what does not guilty mean? Not proven guilty. That's what not guilty means. So to a certain extent, the defendant has only one plea, not guilty. I've not been proven guilty, Your Honor. Okay? All right, so make sure you get this down. And if you look for the criminal cases, note number, uh, page number 10, first paragraph. <clears throat> Note number 10, last sentences in that. I think it is one of the, the last sentences. No man should be deprived of his life under the forms of law unless the jurors who try him are able upon their conscience, uh, consciences, to say that the evidence before them is sufficient to show beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of every fact necessary to constitute the crime charged. That the state has proven every single element of the crime charge. That's what they're going to have to do. Okay? All righty. Now, have that down? I was gun-shy pulling the trigger here. <laughs> Literally, no. I'm always worried that you're not getting it down fast enough. I, I you know, I, I put them up and I said, and some students say, well, I want to hear what you're saying. I don't want to be writing because I'm not paying attention. <clears throat> okay. All righty. Next, Roman numeral six. What's the degree of proof? Well, we just talked about it. <clears throat> there are three degrees of proof that usually comes up under evidence. There's a preponderance of the evidence. There is clear and convincing evidence, and there is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the preponderance of the evidence, and that's the evidence that we use in civil cases, 
you only have to prove, the plaintiff only has to prove their case by a preponderance of the evidence or 50% plus, or as we sometimes say, more likely than not. In other words, if you're going to show for breach of contract, you have to show more likely than not there was a valid contract, more likely than not the plaintiff proved that the defendant did not perform and therefore breached the contract, and more likely than not, not <clears throat> the testimony and evidence showed the damages that the plaintiff suffered. That you have to prove things to a certain degree of certainty. But for civil contracts, torts, it's more likely than not <clears throat> the defendant knew with substantial certainty that he would cause a harmful offensive contact to Ruth Garrett. Okay. All right. Clear and convincing evidence, that's about 80 to 85 percent. We very seldom use it. There are certain proofs that the court may require, but we don't need that. The one that we're going to use in this class is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, no one is ever going to know or require that absolute certainty. Never. Okay. It's 90 to 95%. It's not beyond a shadow of a doubt. Let me give you an example. Now, that's what we use for beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's say that we are in a brick and mortar law school and we uh, have a class and we're up maybe on the fifth floor. Windows are all sealed closed. Two doors going into our classroom. We decide to go out and have a cup of coffee on break. So we go out there, and um, the doors are closed, and all of a sudden we hear a gunshot. So two people left in that room, and so we will go over. The doors are locked from the inside. We finally break our way in. We look through the windows, and there is one of the students literally with the smoking gun standing over another student on the ground. So the police come, they arrest him, charge him with the homicide of that fellow student. And of course, we'd have to go to the court. We'd have to go to the case. I have to make it part of the assignment for the class to follow this. And all of a sudden, the defendant, one of the student, the defendant, the student makes a stand. And his attorney says, oh, please tell us, uh, what happened on the day in question? Well, we were having a class. It was a riveting lecture by Ed Green, of course. And we had a break. Everybody left. It was just us two left. All of a sudden, the door slammed closed and locked. An alien beamed down, shot the one student, put the gun in my hand, and beamed out of there. Nobody saw the alien. By the time they came to the door, it was me holding the smoking gun. And Judge says, uh, that's, that's the testimony you're going with, huh? You go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he looks at your attorney and says, are you trying for an insanity plea? No, 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 Your Honor, this is exactly what happened. So now, <clears throat> uh, case is over. Uh, I mean, it's the, as far as the facts go, and now we're in the jury room. And somehow we get a video feed in there, all right? And an audio feed. And everybody, there's 11 people voting guilty. And one person keeps saying, yeah, but you know what? I, I just keep thinking about that alien. I watch those alien shows, all right? And, and, and that guy with the hair, that guy, I mean, he's very compelling. And the other guy that always goes to all these locations, it's, it, you know, I, I keep thinking about that the alien came down. He goes, okay, now wait a minute. Now, all right. Now, the person only has to prove 90 to 95%. Do you have any, any doubt that this guy shot him? Yeah, the aliens. Well, here's the question. Is that reasonable? Now, I want you to think about it. Reasonable. Shut off the TV in your head for a minute and think, is that a reasonable belief? 
Well, I guess not. All right. So then the state has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. The doubts that you entertain are unreasonable. You see? And we're never going to look for those. It's not beyond any doubt that you have no doubt that the, that the state has to prove it 100% because that'll never happen. So all you have to do is, do you have any doubts? Of course, there's always a chance that something else could have caused the death. I don't care what it was. Okay? I mean, when it comes down to it, there's two things. One, circumstantial evidence, eyewitness. Did anyone see that guy pull the trigger on his fellow student? The answer is no. So we have to take it by the circumstances. We hear the gunshot, gunshot go off. The doors are locked from the inside. The windows are sealed from the inside. The one student standing over the student with the smoking gun. Circumstances and life and logic tells us who must have shot him. Now, it could have been he shot himself and you were struggling with the gun and he pulled the trigger shooting himself. And then of course being shot, he let go of the gun and there you have the gun. Always a possibility, but that wasn't your excuse. You see, there's always some doubt. Give us some evidence, testimony, something that's reasonable. Let me have some reasonable doubt. What you're telling me does not raise a reasonable doubt. It raises an unreasonable doubt. Sure, there's always the possibility. We've always learned that in college. Everything is possible, but not everything is probable. And that's what we deal with in law, probabilities. And in criminal law, we only have to prove, beyond. if you have any doubts and they're unreasonable, then the state has done their job and have every element beyond a reasonable doubt. We were just reading that over on page 10. Okay, first paragraph right at the end, no man should be deprived of his life under the forms of law unless the jurors who try him are able upon their conscience to say that the evidence before them is sufficient to show beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of every fact necessary to constitute the crime charged. Not beyond a shadow of a doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. So, yes, you can have doubt. Is it reasonable? O.J. Simpson's case, you might have heard about it. It was in all the papers. Okay. When O.J.'s trial for criminal law came, he was found not guilty. Now, they interviewed the jurors. And I don't know if you paid much attention to it because, it's, I mean, as a, an attorney and a professor, I mean, it made, I, I wanted to know what was going on. And those jurors, you know what the jurors said? The jurors said, yes, we believe he did it. However, we had reasonable doubts. And you know what? Let me just give you one of the examples of reasonable doubt. They found blood on the, uh, I think it's on the fence or the gate at Nicole's home. The problem was when they tested that blood, that blood had a certain chemical in it. And you know what that chemical was? That chemical is when you take a blood test from somebody, you put this chemical in there to preserve it and to keep it from coagulating. And that's the chemical that was found on the gate. Now, how did that get there? I mean, you, no one bleeds blood with that chemical in it. That blood had to come from a sample of blood, and they found it after they had taken a sample of blood from OJ, and they had put this uh, chemical in there. So see, those are some of the things that when the jurors looked at it and said, you know what, why is that blood there? I have doubts whether it's there. Somebody sure looks like they want us to believe he's there, I don't think that this evidence proves that he was there. So you still haven't proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he did it. You see, they had doubts. 
and they believed that their doubts were reasonable. So since the state, the people did not prove each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt, the jury, jury only had one, one verdict, it was not guilty. Now, when they went to the civil case, we now are on the preponderance of evidence. And like I said, all the jurors believe that he did it. It's just that they had some doubts. It was like, well, you know what? Yeah, I, I think more likely than not he did it, but to say that beyond a reasonable doubt, no, I got some questions about some things. You see, that's what they were at. And that's rightfully so, they should have come back with a not guilty. When it came to the civil case, what was he found? Found completely liable. Why? Because the juror was consistent with the criminal juror. Oh, yeah. We believe more likely than not he did. Oh, okay. You see, if he would have been found guilty of the criminal, then as far as the civil goes, there really isn't a trial. Because the criminal has proven that he did it beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a much higher standard than the preponderance of evidence. And then all we're looking at is damages and things like that. That's all we look at. And have when you don't have beyond a reasonable doubt, we can't presume, well, there's a preponderance evidence. Where do you get that? There might not even be that. There might be so much doubt that it really negates even the preponderance of evidence. So that's why when it came to the civil trial, we had to show and prove, the plaintiff had to show and prove that more likely than not, O.J. Simpson killed Nicole and Goldman. That's what he had to prove. Okay? And they did it because he was found liable for the deaths of Nicole and Ron Goldman. Okay? So that's what we get with that degree of proof. There's the burden of proof, the state has it, and the degree of proof beyond a, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, there's going to be some defenses that the defense may raise, such as insanity. Now, for that defendant, does the plaintiff have to prove, or the people have to prove, prove that the defendant was sane while he uh, committed the crime? The answer is no. There's a presumption that he was sane in his right mind. And if the defendant wants to raise that as a defense, then the burden is on the defendant to prove each and every element of the insanity defense. However, the majority rule is that the defendant need only prove it by a preponderance of the evidence. So the people could say that, yes, the people, I mean, the jurors could say, beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant commit every element of murder. However, the defendant proved that more likely than not, it occurred while he was insane. So therefore, the defendant is not guilty by reason of insanity. Okay? Now, there are a couple jurisdictions that require those affirmative defenses to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. They feel if the state has that burden, and the defendant should. But that's a very few. Just a couple. Okay? All they have to do is by preponderance of the evidence. Okay, well, the next topic is our crime elements. We start to get into the crime elements. Actus reus, the guilty act, and mens rea, the guilty mind. We will pick this up on Wednesday. So uh, as far as today goes, we are just going to leave off at some of the preliminary stuff. We are going to talk about, we have to talk about the, the, the actus reus, the acts. We'll talk about the omission to act. Uh, and then we'll talk about mens rea. Okay? All right, gang. You guys have a great evening. Um, and I will see everybody on Wednesday. And um, continue on our journey in criminal law. It'll be a lot of fun. It'll be quick. It'll be nice. Uh, and one thing about it, you read the cases. They, they, you're not going to be falling asleep while you're reading the cases. Okay? That's one thing that's good. All right, gang. Talk to you guys later. Good night, all.